Hello and welcome to my weekly roundup of quite interesting cycling tech news. And is Campag launching a wireless group set? SRAM updates its red ETAP flagship group set. Has somebody finally invented a self inflating tire? And the big topic in this video are modern bikes better looking or worse than old bikes? Let's dive in. And before I do, a quick reminder to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And I promise. There'll be no mention of disc brakes in this video at all. Firstly, there have been loads of rumour and speculation in recent weeks about new group sets possibly coming out this year. I talked briefly about Shimano and Wireless and a possible rival ETAP group set from SRAM. Well, now it looks like Campag could be going wireless as well, making this quite possibly the year of the wireless group set. Over on the popular Cycling Tips website, they found a bunch of patents that show the Italian company is clearly working on making its electronic EPS wire group set wireless. Now, firstly, of course, it goes without saying, this doesn't mean anything in terms of it launching new products. It's very common for companies like Shimano, SRAM, and Campag to file patents for all sorts of products and concepts that never see the light of day. But given how these three big group set manufacturers tend to follow the same sort of product cycle, uh, 10 speed, 11 speed, 12 speed, EPS, DI2, wireless, so what can we tell from the patent drawings? Well, they actually show quite a clever implementation of wireless and battery technology. It looks like the rear mech has a removable battery like SRAM, while the front mech looks like it's not removable but has a charge port, so it remains to be seen what details are on that. And at the shifters, it looks like probably, I can presume, coin cell battery like we have with ETAP, which lasts for blimmin' ages, about a year, I think, between changes. So similar system to SRAM. We can guess it's a full wireless system like SRAM, so no wire between any of the mechanisms, batteries or shifters, where it looks like Shimano are going semi-wireless, like the FSA WE system, which came out two years ago, where the rear mech, front mech and the battery are wired together in the loop, and then the wireless uh, shifters communicate to those separately. So a uh, full wireless system like SRAM will make building a bike very easy, no wires at all, um, but remains to be seen what actually happens if and when they launch a group set. Putting the batteries inside the mechanism is a really smart move if they can pull it off. Now we know with SRAM the batteries hang off the front and rear mechanism. They can be removed, so very easy with charging. The battery runtime isn't as good as DI2 with a bigger battery, but inside the frame. So if they can pull it off, um, it should mean this group set looks really smart and clean because with the best wheel in the world, DI2 and ETAP aren't the prettiest, quite big mechanism compared to mechanical, which are much smaller, much more compact, uh, arguably more elegant as well. So very smart design. Another detail is a added motion sensor, which I guess detects the movement of the chain to wake the system up. So it's prepared and ready for a gear change to minimize any delay and also increase the runtime between gear changes. Now I'm no electronics expert, but if you are, then do feel free to add your thoughts in the comment section down below. So, when it's coming out, nobody knows. Hopefully, we'll see something this year. It could be really exciting to see what Campag can do in the wireless market. Actual group set news now, and SRAM has expanded its range topping red ETAP access group set with the addition of a brand new rear derailleur designed to work with the new 1036 cassette it launched with a Force ETAP wide group set launched late last year. You might see my review of that on a Trek Money link above if you missed it. So this new rear mech increases the choice of builds and range of options now available on its red ETAP flagship group set, basically giving a much lower gear and wider range of gears available. It's not surprising that SRAM launched its wide range cassette option on Force first. It's much more popular at wider and lower price points. And because red, like dual race, is primarily aimed at the demands of pro racing cyclists where speed is everything. But that is all changing. Lots of people want and can afford the top end components but want the more accessible gearing, and that's what this updated red now offers. The new derailleur can be used with a smaller cassette down to 1028, but no smaller than that. And all the existing tech in that rear mech from the previous version is the same in this new one. It costs the same as well, 610 pounds. There's no new red 1036 cassette. Instead, it's updated the XG1270 cassette from last year, ditching the all black finish for a nickel chrome finish, and that costs 170 pounds. So adding a bigger cassette to red is just simply the changing times. As an aside, SRAM told me its smallest 1026 cassette is being discontinued, it's just not that popular. And most of the pros actually use a 1028, 
but 1033 has been a strong seller and I fully expect this new 1036 option on red ETAP to be really popular, especially with more all-road gravel bikes that the group set can now be used with two by or one by. Road bikes have developed and evolved so much since the original safety bicycle, but there's one area where they still lag behind in terms of technology, and that's flat tires and punctures. How about an auto-inflating, self-inflating tire that you never need to pump up with a pump ever again? That sounds amazing. And it's no longer a thing of the future, it could be a reality very soon. So some very clever Dutch people have developed a system that integrates a compact electro-pneumatic pump into the hub of the wheel, which is connected to the rim via a tube. So the idea is simply, you set your pressure via an app and the system monitors your tire pressure all the time and keeps it at a perfect level. Not too high, not too low, just perfect all the time, which sounds amazing to me. Never have to pump your tire up ever again. And it's clearly early days for the technology, but the implications are pretty huge in my mind. Not only would it mean you no longer have to check your tire pressure, but you can adjust the pressure during a ride. So if it starts raining during a ride, you can drop your pressure a few PSI to give you more pressure. If you're riding a gravel bike and you need to ride road, get to the off-road, you have your tires higher for the road section and then let them down when you get to the woods or trails. So being able to adjust your pressure has many implications and I'm sure there are many that I haven't thought of yet. So uh, fantastic, really tantalizing technology. Of course, as with any new tech, lots of wrinkles to iron out, to weight, drag, reliability, price, etc. But could this be a dawn of an exciting new development in the continuing evolution of the bicycle? We've sure come a long way since a safety bicycle, and clearly still a long way to go before a bicycle becomes the ultimate expression of what it ultimately could be. So yeah, exciting times. And now for my main topic of discussion in this week's video, are modern bikes better looking or worse looking than old bikes? So I was thinking this the other day when I was filming the lovely Avilia Falante SLR for an upcoming review, which in my opinion is a beautiful bike. But is it more beautiful than an old bike? So I thought, let's have a bit of fun and see what you guys think. So quite simply, I'm gonna pop up some images side by side of an old bike versus a new bike. And I want you all to let me know in the comment section below whether you prefer the old bike or a new bike. Get a feel for whether you think bikes have improved in terms of appearance. So not talking about performance or stiffness or weight or any of that sort of stuff, just purely visual, how it looks, where it makes you go, wow, yeah, that's a good looking bike, or that's a horrible looking bike. So let me know down below, and let's start with Avilia, of course. So the Italian company launched way back in 1906, but it's a period during the 1940s that really came to define the company, and in particular, the Ramata copper plated finish that really defined the legacy for decades afterwards. And this is a bike from the 1940s. Classic, simple steel frame. It had just four gears. So very beautiful bike, very reminiscent of the 1940s. And here it is compared to the latest state-of-the-art Falante SLR. So full carbon fiber, aero, disc brake, electronics. Which is your bike, 1940s or 2021? Let me know in the comment section down below. Wow, here we go. The Lotus 108 versus the Cervelo P5X. In my opinion, the Lotus 108 is one of the best looking bikes ever made. A bike that carried Chris Boardman to Olympic success. A stunning bike, re redefined what a bike could look like. Uh, really threw the rule book out of the window, although the rule book came back and hit them in the face. So stunning looking bike. And the Cervelo P5X is probably, in a way, the spiritual successor in terms of a bike design for maximum aero and disregarding the rules because it doesn't apply to UCI uh, races. It's a triathlon Ironman bike. You never use that in a wild tour race. So two striking bikes, which would you choose? Old versus new, let me know down below. Onto a really interesting comparison here, two Tour de France champions, an Eddie Merckx 1969 Reynolds 531 tubed frame made by a local Belgian frame builder and self-named versus the current Tour de France, well not the current, but the most recent Tour de France winning bike, the Pinarello Dogma S12. So both Tour de France champion bikes. Which should you pick? Old versus new? Let me know down below. Aerodynamics has become a hot topic in the road cycling market these days, but it's not all that new. Go back a few years, well quite a few years, and the Chanelli Laser was an iconic, groundbreaking aerodynamic road bike using a steel frame. And here it is compared to the latest state-of-the-art Scott foil. 
Which will you choose? Well, let me know down below. On to my last comparison, and carbon fiber, as you know, has come to redefine what a road bike can do and how it can ride. And a Conargo C40, launched in 1994, was a carbon fiber lugged superbike that was tough enough to win the toughest races, Paris Bay, with bike breaking cobbles. And here it is compared to probably one of the most modern, state of the art carbon fiber bikes you can currently buy the specialized ASOS with its sub 600 gram disc brake electronic only carbon fiber frame. But which is prettier? C40, ASOS? Of course, let me know down below. And that is a good place to sign off, I reckon. Hopefully you enjoyed watching the video, and if you did, well, you know the score by now. Like the video, subscribe if you haven't already. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Any questions down below, and I'll see you all again next time. Thank you so much for watching.